Hey, hey, the drug class. Woo! All right, guys, coronavirus day. We're going to do the amphetamine lecture. These slides are basically the same ones we saw at the end of the cocaine lecture. I'm eager for you to just be able to get a feel for the take home messages, and we'll have, you know, as productive a class as we can. I hate doing it this way, and I'd much rather be with you, believe me. I can't see your face, and so I don't know if you understand or not. I'm going to try to be clear. You can write me emails if you have questions or put them in this YouTube business if you get a chance. My hope is none of this is going to last long, and we'll all be having fun discussing drugs in no time. So amphetamine is not quite as riveting as cocaine, perhaps, but it's got its own unique qualities. We're going to get into our regular categories. We've got a guy to think about, a neurotransmitter system. We've got history. We've got some fun facts that go with this drug as well. We're going to see some recurring themes, as we've seen from other plant-based drugs, as well as some novelties. So bottom line here, the whole history of amphetamine is really like other plant medicines that have gone awry. So we've got literally good old Shenang and Mahuang. And you know how I love talking about Mahuang, but Mahuang is essentially this spiny little green plant that happens to have intriguing stimulant properties and also seems to play a role in respiration. So we've got the classic acute effects, some of the same chronic effects, and we've known about it since literally 2737 BC. So 5,000 years ago, people had Mahuang, and they used it to get stimulated. Literally, for millennia, it was just a wonderful plant medicine folks could use whenever they wanted. Overdose was incredibly rare. You didn't really hear about it much. Lo and behold, a certain subgroup of folks got a hold of it that subgroup is really into better, stronger, faster. Now, I'm not sure who it is exactly, <coughs> Caucasians, but ephedrine was basically isolated as the active ingredient within the plant. Now, it's not the only active ingredient in the plant. There are other molecules that are pretty close and also other ones that often come in combination with the whole plant that takes some of the aversive side effects, alternative effects, long-term effects away. But we had that oddball, monotheistic, single-molecule model. And so they said, let's find the one thing. And of course, it was ephedrine. Literally, decades later, Gordon Alice, and this is one of the few names you're going to have to know, and in fact, although Shenang isn't Caucasian, <laughs> Gordon Alice was, he was a splendid chemist. I think there's a building named after him at Caltech. He had a PhD in chemistry, did some wild work, but truth is, 1927 into the 30s, you know what the economy was like here in the U.S., kind of like it's going to be soon again, but the bottom line was he was just trying to make a living and he was really interested in psychoactive molecules. So he did some work at uh, UC San Francisco, had an appointment briefly at UCLA, and essentially developed a process for making amphetamine sulfate, a synthetic version of ephedrine. Now, he wasn't the first guy to have an actual amphetamine made, but he was the one who developed this process. It seemed to go particularly well. It had a lot of adaptive potential, and like they did back in the day, he had tried it on the self, thought it was 
a bit of a mood brightener, seem to decrease appetite. All in all, noticed uh, if you did happen to have a runny nose, it seemed to improve with this. And lo and behold, he went to uh, basically a, a pharmaceutical company that was willing to produce it in mass. He ended up uh, making quite a bit off those profits, later donated money to have that building built at, uh, I think it was Caltech. The guy had a really weird life because he also did some work on creating insulin for diabetes, and later he died of complications related to diabetes, and he didn't even know he had it. So take-home message, go to the doctor and have your blood sugar measured because... They're good interventions. Well, so by the early 30s, we had a product named Benzedrine, which is essentially amphetamine on these little cotton balls or on these uh, sort of cotton hand wipe looking things, much like the ones that we have all over the place now that everybody's getting so paranoid about using, but if you can imagine that, immersed in an amphetamine solution and then stuck in a little bottle, that was the first Benzedrine inhaler. And if you did happen to suffer from asthma, you felt the first parts of an attack coming on, you could huff that up and have some at least brief relief from the potential of an attack, especially if you intervened a little early. And good old Chenang had said this had that potential literally in 2737 BC, but now we had an artificially app approved one, uh, one that was manufactured relatively cheaply, and one that was widely available. Now, legend has it a few jazz musicians and people who might have spoken Spanish ended up saying, hey, I could get this little cotton wad out of there and maybe just soak it in water for a while and drink the water. And lo and behold, you could stay up all night playing that crazy jazz. Obviously, Ben's dream was a stimulant, and this got to be a bit of a popular habit. Well, legend has it, World War II, pretty much every side gave some kind of version of amphetamines as well. So when, uh, basically when Hitler was taking over Poland and everybody said, oh, well, he won't make it all the way here in time. We've got a day to move our tanks and stuff like that. And then suddenly, whammo, there he was. They realized, wow, these soldiers are either superhuman or what was really the truth, they were on meth and didn't need to sleep. As we know, with chronic use, it also tends to lead to paranoia and a lot of, well, shall we say, ill-advised encounters. So, essentially, the Nazis just started taking over and could often appear in places that were hard to predict. You'll notice these, uh, at least films, if not... Uh, well, there's basically all these films of Hitler, and in the later 40s, you start to see him shaking. There's all this uh, historical conjecture about, oh, we think maybe he had Parkinson's, but I have an alternative explanation, and that's basically by 1941, he was so strung out on meth, he was either so amped up he was shaking, or he was in withdrawal and shaking, so... Obviously, we're never going to know for sure, but when you look at some of his really bad moves against Russia in the winter and, and things like that, you can't help but wonder, was this guy uh, a little speeding out? By the 50s, late 50s, even early 60s, we did see various drugs that were all variations on this used as diet aids and at least prescribed as antidepressants in that sort of mother's little helper tradition. So when my dad first met my mom in 1962, he thought, hey, this woman is the most energetic woman I've ever met. I think I'll marry her. But my mom, of course, was watching her weight and taking speeders all the time. And then lo and behold, she went off them. 
and had a big old depressive episode. And my dad was like, what have I done? Ah! And then I was born and then everything, well, you can imagine. Well, so in addition, we start to see the increase of amphetamine and methamphetamine as a drug of abuse. Clearly, the illusion of being able to stay awake and think hard was certainly there. The expectation of that was around, but we also have data suggesting there really are some mild, reasonable, not huge impacts on cognition. So you do get the chance to say, yes, in fact, speeders improve working memory, short-term memory, maybe other aspects of encoding, but we're talking about really small effects on rather mundane little tasks. So you recall some of those nicotine data where people are doing the Macintosh clock. Yes, you can certainly be vigilant. You can certainly have your eyes open, but it is not this legendary enhancer of creativity or output that necessarily everyone supposedly thinks. There are some rumors from the Beats about, you know, Jack Kerouac shooting heroin, I mean, shooting amphetamine and then writing a lot, or, well, all the Beats did it. What can I say? I don't think that means you need to use amphetamine to be creative, but if you are a bit creative, the amphetamines can help you stay awake to be creative more. Philip K. Dick, that paranoid nut and all his wild delusional stories in science fiction, it kind of makes sense when you think about why would somebody come up with, you know, the story that became Minority Report or some of uh, Paycheck, some of the other wild movies that play with time, space, and who is real and who is not. Because if you stay awake for three days and don't have any dreams, you kind of start having dreams on your own. Well, these kind of dropped, particularly as folks tended to see some of the negative consequences in the 70s, but we should recall this was also when cocaine was suddenly taking off. So I'm not sure to say we learned our lesson or we just found some other way to get stimulated and one that people seem to prefer because of its wild euphoric effects. But compared to cocaine, amphetamine has a much longer half-life, and has, in a sense, not that crazy, neurotic, narcissistic self-confidence. So people think, oh, well, this isn't so bad, and it lasts longer. I can certainly work hard on the assembly line, and man, it just, it's kind of heartbreaking. And then meth methamphetamine basically re-emerged in the 90s, again, after a crazy coke time had ended. So, we kind of got that same pattern where we have a, a decent plant medicine, a subset of humans get a hold of it, get the active ingredient out, make a synthetic version, abuse the hell out of it, and have a lot of negative consequences. All right. On my right here, I actually do have the ephedra plant, ephedra vulgaris, now, it goes by a whole lot of different names, but other plants that are in the same genus sometimes get confused for it. So I've you know, seen people say, oh, it's also called Mormon's tea. Actually, there's a Mormon's tea that's in the same genus that's a different species. It doesn't have quite the same stimulating effects. You'll notice it is growing on a kind of sandy area. It is pretty resilient. It does seem to grow in... Uh, basically places that aren't necessarily too wet and places that are super hot. We don't have the data the way we had with coffee, but it does seem to make sense that maybe if it's up higher and uh, gets a whole lot of heat and light, it's, it's bound to do better. But that's true for lots of plants. And then down the left-hand side here, you can see I've got basically all these different versions of pretty much exactly the same thing. Amphetamine has a couple of different isomers depending upon where uh, two of the parts of the molecule are placed. 
And then meth, of course, has that extra methyl group. But these are all really variations on it. So you see Adipex, which was a diet aid for a while. Benzedrine, which was uh, one we talked about, but this is actually the, the pill version. We got our old friend Ritalin down here, which is essentially uh, related to uh, at least one, if not two, of the amphetamine isomers. We'll get into that as a treatment for ADHD. It also seemed to have some genuine medical uh, uses, not only for that, but also for narcolepsy. You don't need to know these names. I just wanted to emphasize that the marketing geniuses uh, took pretty much every variation and made it into something. You love the old Adipex ending and the Benzedrine, and we'll have Zizix eventually when uh, the marketing guys get those data on how X's and Z's make people think drugs are effective. Well, with methamphetamine, we've got that extra. Sorry about that little glitch. Yeah, it was a major club drug. Um, so this body by crystal meth is just trying to make the point that this does end up decreasing appetite to the point of absurdity for a lot of folks. Uh, there was a, an old ad campaign where a bunch of models had the same background and haircut, and so they were just trying to play off that. On the upper picture there, we've just got a whole bunch of meth there. You can see it uh, looks a lot like crack, and man, <laughs> it does uh, not have all the same euphoric effects, but certainly is stimulating. It does really sound like a panic attack. I did want to say a couple words on narcolepsy, just because it's a debilitating illness uh, it's got that narco in it, like the same root, uh, narcos in Greek, which means sleep. Narcoleptics could fall asleep uh, really, really easily and sometimes dangerously so. So they could literally be standing up and fall down. I mentioned my Uncle Jerry had this. He didn't have it quite as bad, but if he sat on the couch, he definitely fell asleep. And it wasn't just from overwork. Later, he actually responded well to uh, an, an amphetamine-based treatment for that and could stay awake. I've, you know, heard some rough case studies where this poor woman couldn't even hold her own infant. She'd have to lie down on the floor with the baby in case she was going to fall asleep almost immediately. So it's pretty, pretty dreadful. The other medical use that's approved is ADHD, and we're going to get to that right now. So here are a few key points about ADHD. I know I promised you guys you could uh, watch this and still do your laundry or uh, chop your vegetables. So I am going to read the slide. I do not recommend this for normal presentations. So it's the most common psychological disorder among children. It's actually the most diagnosed. Whether it's actually the most common is certainly up for debate. There was a time when basically if you were a little boy and you couldn't actually sit in a chair for six hours straight, like, you know, a little boy, then you often ended up with this diagnosis. On the other end, though, folks who are averse to using the meds can really have a rough time on their kids so that the chance to develop an identity as somebody who actually can succeed as school is, is often sacrificed. So if we wait till you're in your teens when you have ADHD and it goes either undiagnosed or untreated, it, it can be a, a rough comeback, shall we say. It can be hard to take on that identity as uh, somebody who could be a scholar. Of course, we know tons and tons of scholars with ADHD, and I'm not going to point any fingers, but that distractibility and the uh, inability to pay attention is something I'm going to elaborate on, but those were definitely the hallmark symptoms for a while, but it was unfortunate because basically if you were a little boy and a teacher thought you were a pain in the ass, you could also end up uh, getting a recommendation for this as well. I'm going to emphasize low doses are definitely key. Start low, go slow, as I'll be saying in the Canvas lectures. And truth be told, it's not like you need it every day. So certainly in the summer, when you're going to go run around summer camp anyway, it really doesn't seem to be essential. And 
I got to be honest, if your job is alphabetizing tax forms and you need to take Adderall in order to do it, maybe you could just find a job not doing that kind of stuff. So I'm going to talk about some behavioral interventions, and most of them are environmental. But, oh man, truth be told, let's, let's, let's not take too many jobs for the man that require doing boring, repetitive tasks over and over if we can help it. I commend all of you for being in college, and I certainly hope that stuff works out for you. So it is three times higher for boys than for girls. It just means it's, it's definitely prevalent. What's curious to me is that this tends to normalize when we get to adult ADHD, and so I, I do wonder if maybe girls are misdiagnosed or just somehow missed in the diagnostic procedure because of this statistic. So if you do have... You know, you meet a little girl and she's having these same symptoms. Let's not be uh, gender biased in our ability to recognize some of these. The ADHD data on IQ are actually pretty impressive. So there's a full range. Literally, you can have uh, certainly any IQ from 70 to 130 with it. And it's independent of that. But on average, they are not dumb. Like average to above average intelligence on all the data sets I've seen and I really want to emphasize this because just because you can't sit still doesn't mean you're not creative and a genius. And so I do feel like the interventions are important and making sure that you're matched to a task that's more appropriate for your learning style, shall we say, really is important. Now this uh, stat says 40 to 60% of these children show symptoms persisting to adulthood. That's true. I should add, though, that a lot of folks don't get diagnosed until adulthood. I don't think a whole bunch of people are necessarily walking around with undiagnosed ADHD, but I alluded to this when we were talking about crack cocaine and even intranasal cocaine. There's a subset of folks who often discover stimulants on their own, certainly appreciate their effects, admire their uh, ability to enhance some cognitive processing, but Well, with these symptoms in mind, let's think about sort of what are the hallmarks? Is it a misnomer? And what's a good way to conceptualize it? Well, all in all, I think some of the best theorizing about this was done by Dr. Russell Barkley. He spent a ton of time really trying to make sense of this literature. We do have at least from the early 1900s, some research suggesting this was a disorder and seemed to even have some subtypes. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual did a lot of struggling in an effort to really just make sense of the whole disorder in an effort to categorize in hopes of having decent treatments. It was called minimal brain dysfunction for a while. The Diagnostic hair splitting was getting pretty nutty. By the time we get to uh, the DSM-5, some of the subtypes are, are kind of done in. But we really do seem to have an inattentive component, a sort of distractibility aspect, and just a being hyper, just a being not being able to sit still sort of set of symptoms that were frequently called executive function. Barclay did a great job of pointing out that executive function wasn't particularly well defined and that we needed to think about it in a different way. In a sense, it was all about uh, an inability to bring your attention back to yourself to make a decent decision about how you want to spend your time. So we talked about executive function when I've talked about stimulus in the past. There seems to be a poor control for the ability to inhibit a dominant response. So some of the neuropsychological tests basically have you uh, try to stop one dominant strategy in an effort to use a more adaptive one like the Stroop. So if I had the word red written in blue letters and I said, hey, the task here is to name the color of the ink, that natural reading of the word red would interfere with the correct answer having to say 
with the word blue because that was the color of the ink. I used to do this with hyperactive kids at the little school in Chinatown in New York City and had one student really do a superb job on it after really not doing a very good job on some of the other tasks. And I said, hey, man, great job. How did you do that? And he said, oh, I can't read. So if you don't have the interfering component, obviously it's not going to be uh, as big an issue. But one of the other tasks that's typical is uh, trails, which is basically like one of those old dot-to-dot -dot things where when you were a little kid, you'd go from the one to the two and then draw a line from the two to the three and then from the three to the four. That's really straightforward and easy. But then what they call trails B has you alternate from a number to a letter. So you'll see all these little dots with one and then A and then two and then B and then three and then C. And so you're supposed to go from one to A, from A to two, from two to B, from B to three. And this having to go back and forth is, again, trying to interfere with a dominant response of just going number, number, number. This is something folks with ADHD really despise, especially little kids. I had a kid doing it. What you're supposed to do is when they make a mistake, you're supposed to stop them and say, remember, it's number letter, number letter. And the poor guy just took the pen, started making big scribbles all over. And he says, why is it always me? And I thought, that is a real bummer. And truth be told, here you are doing this kind of mindless task that does feed into your own problematic set of symptoms. It was not a pleasant time. So, of course, I let him just mess around for a while and then come back. He did do a little bit better because I let him run around a bit. And that does kind of underscore one of the big issues, which is this is an under arousal issue. If you aren't appropriately aroused with your brain, of course you're going to jump around and try to get as much stimulation as possible because, hey, that's what we were evolved to do. And they often do better. So if you can get them more aroused, like some of the stories I've told, lo and behold, the attentional capacity does seem to improve and they can do a little bit better on these tasks Exercise for ADD is actually really a nice, healthy, low side effect kind of intervention. But again, it's not perfect. And this is part of why the stimulants seem to work. It seems ironic that somebody who can't sit still would require yet another stimulation added. But lo and behold, the data suggests it really does work and it seems to be consistent with this uh, low arousal theory. So Barclay said, look, there are these things that are described as executive function, but I think they all can boil down to this notion of bringing attention back to the self to re-decide how you want to spend the time. And his interventions are a little complicated, but uh, a nice way to look at it given how poorly executive function has been defined. I do want to move to some of the treatments that have been proposed for adults, and I hate to say it, these are wonderful interventions for pretty much any of us. So we've got a chance to look at uh, the Saffron treatment model, which is one of the ones I teach in the graduate psychotherapy class. And if you can't take a look here, I will read you the options, but they're really all about attending to the tasks you need to get done making goals that are consistent with your own values, learning how to solve problems, and then handling the, the nonsense of life, the paperwork and the sorting and filing and things like that, so that you can get these things done and build a life that would mean something to you. So the Saffron Treatment Manual is really big on continuing to monitor your progress throughout, so making sure that clients and patients and anybody gets acknowledged for the progress they're already making. Hey, if you've made it this far, odds are high you're doing something right, and let's make sure you get really acknowledged for that. Thank God for the apps we have now on our phone, but basically the key intervention is to have a calendar, literally anything that is scheduled 
needs to end up on your calendar and then take that calendar and turn it each day into a task list. So that day and that day alone, there are a set of tasks ideally scheduled at specific times. So if you do catch yourself running after something shiny, you can look on that task list and know what you want to return to that's consistent with your values. Now, I know some of you have seen me carrying around those little three by five cards, and some of you have seen those little three by five cards that I've left lying around, and it, it is a little bit comical that I would get distracted and leave the card, but this is exactly how it's done. So first, let's get in touch with your values in life. What really matters to you? And let's set some goals, both long-term and short-term, to make sure you're going to get to live the kind of life that is consistent with your values. With those in mind, then, let's set some goals, especially some distal goals, some long-term goals. Where do you want to be in five years? And I know that's a crazy question at certain ages of life, but let's just kind of envision that for a minute. What would you like to be doing? How would you want to be spending your time? What sorts of friends do you want? Once we've got that in mind, then we have to break it down into doable chunks. All right, well, if that's where I want to be in five years, what do I have to do at four years, at three years, at two years, and so on? Right now, I've got to start planning maybe just at the semester level as you finish up a degree. That's a fine perspective to take, knowing that, hey, I know I, the degree is sort of my longer-term goal because I'm thinking it's going to set me up for even better ones. What do I need to do this month? What do I need to do this week? And then finally, what do I need to do today? And that set of tasks and that alone end up on your task list. The big advantage is then you've only got one thing you got to pay attention to for the day, it's not an overwhelming, ridiculous list that includes stuff that's not at all relevant for the next week. And it seems doable. It seems like a set of tasks that you can achieve. With the goals prioritized, then, you're going to maybe have little A's and B's and C's next to things to make sure that they really get done and to make sure you get the most important ones done in that day. But if you do schedule specific times for it and you kind of know, hey, maybe at 2 o'clock I'm not going to be able to focus as well as I, I can at 10 o'clock, you would sort of match those up so that the tasks are consistent with when your energy and attention and motivation are primed. Being super careful to make sure you schedule a little bit of time to have fun, a little bit of time to make sure you're really enjoying life. The problem-solving model ends up being the same sort of thing we talked about when we were talking about relapse prevention, but just, hey, what is the deal here? What is this negative consequence? And a lot of times, we don't put it together. How did I end up in this predicament? So we have to define that problem to see what is the source, and hey, bounce it around with your buddies. Call your therapist. Call your mom see what's going on, and then with that in mind, generate as many options as possible. And I got to tell you, folks with ADHD are super creative with some of these and come up with astounding ways to solve some of these problems that I would never think of. Then pick the one that seems to maximize positive outcome chances. Give that a try. If it doesn't work, that's feedback for a new approach for solving that solving for solving that problem. The sorting is literally what's really a priority here in my house. How do I make space for each things so that everything you have has a place to live, has a place to go? Not necessarily the obsessive compulsive a place for everything and everything in its place, but hey, I know my socks live over here, and all the clothes are next to each other. And in the kitchen, I put dishes here and silverware there. And maybe I don't necessarily have the forks in with all the forks, but at least I know where all the silverware lives. Right? And then you don't have as many things flopping around. 
You don't have as many distractions, and away it goes. Filing, I mean, come on, it's the 21st century. How many actual pieces of paper do we need? Odds are high if you can scan it in and put it somewhere on a, a hard drive or in the cloud, it'll be fine. Literally 80% of the papers that we think are so important, oh God, you're probably never going to look at them again. And finally, the homework. I mean, the client has to practice these and has to understand that this isn't the kind of thing that happens overnight and it isn't the kind of thing that happens instantaneously. So you can't just give somebody all these recommendations and have them come back the next week and say, I got it all. You got to do it like you're cleaning the house and cleaning the house is sort of a model for it. Like I can't clean the whole house in one day. It's just too much for me. Well, Let's take it one room at a time. What's one task in one room? And stick at it. And then, literally, after a while, if you set your standards reasonably and put the time in, you can have built-in time in each day. Hey, I need 20 minutes to clean up every day. I need one time each week to make sure I go to the grocery store. I need one time each week to make sure I do my laundry and get this kind of routine going, even if it does sound a little bit rigid, even if it doesn't seem to fit your personality, and then suddenly you know what to do when so that your free time isn't spent wondering what you missed. Easier said than done, and I'm hardly the incarnation of a perfect model of it, but that is the approach, and the data really are encouraging. So here I just have a funny picture of this boy with all these stimuli all around him and sweat coming off his face and a flabbergasted look. And it really does kind of show you all the different distractors that a child might have, but also I think underscores the fact that we think kids are supposed to do everything. So they got a sport, and they're supposed to be incredibly scholarly, and they're supposed to play a musical instrument, and they're supposed to go to houses of worship, and they're supposed to be doing volunteer stuff. Like, when are you supposed to be a kid, you know? So, <clears throat> by all means, have recreational activities you love. Certainly pursue things that are going to lead to the kinds of achievements that you'll be proud to look back on. But you don't need every second scheduled and you don't need to be an Olympic soccer player and an award-winning cellist and also be in charge of all the volunteer work at the old folks' home. Like, let's have reasonable expectations about what folks can do. So I've got a list of the ADHD symptoms that are usually used in the reports that are usually filled out either by a teacher or a parent in an effort to try to diagnose these. And I am going to read the slide again, as I mentioned, but truth be told, this is, in a sense, just a way to suggest if further assessment is appropriate. You know how I am about diagnoses anyway, but no close attention to detail literally doesn't necessarily cross every T and dot every I. Okay, so they're not going to work in a chem lab measuring THC concentrations to the third decimal point or become an accountant. That's all right. There are wonderful things to do in life that don't include that kind of attention to detail, but we can set up an environment to make it so that's not your salvation. Fidgets and squirms, I mean, if you can't sit still... It could be a number of different issues, but this is also something that's kind of consistent with the diagnosis. Leave seat in the classroom. Again, let's talk about what's a reasonable amount of time for a child to be sitting. I don't think the line them all up in rows and make them get ready for factory work is necessarily a great educational model. But how can you do this in a way that's going to be the least disturbing to other classmates and can you learn to sit a reasonable amount of time? Runs and climbs excessively. Again, I think that's absurd. You ought to be able to run and climb whenever you want. It's just a lot of times hyperactive kids tend to do it in settings that 
are uh, a little bit residually deviant. So it's wonderful to climb on the jungle gym. Can we learn that the jungle gym is the cue for climbing and maybe trees, but let's not climb the walls in church, even if church makes you feel like climbing the walls. Uh, these descriptions on the go are driven by a motor. So if you see somebody who really does have those hyperactive symptoms, it does seem like they have almost an enviable engine inside just cranking away at them. And truth be told, it's, it's wonderful in certain settings and in, in a way adaptive and looks like excitement. But if it just never seems to end or doesn't seem to respond to cues when everyone else is having nap time, we might want to see if there's a way to teach better stimulus control. Talk successively, well, I can hardly point any fingers, but usually this ends up being uh, an issue socially because people don't want to be friends with people who don't let them talk. Those folks usually end up being academics, so I'm not going to make much of that. And then difficulty awaiting turn. So the whole standing in line thing is an unfortunate part of life. It's a lot to ask of a child, but it's a skill worth having, particularly if you can learn how to do it when it's essential. But in all, I think if the line doesn't have something you want, just don't stand in it. All right, and this is just me, again, pointing out that this is a, a rough situation to be in. It really does seem like uh, the, this poor kid's uh, neck is on a swivel and looking around at all sides. You really are trying to find a stimulating thing in your life, but more than anything, it's a little bit of uh, a failure to attend for a long duration. And this is what seems to be consistent with that dopaminergic model. So yes, the stimulants do seem to increase the amount of time that dopamine is in the synapse, and that's often generally rewarding. That led to this low arousal theory that maybe they don't have enough dopamine at baseline. And in addition, if there is another rewarding thing in the environment, it does create a bit of a spark of dopamine, shall we say. And so, of course, that's distracting. You want to go to anything that's going to be positively reinforcing that way. Unfortunately, it doesn't often bring you to the longer term goals you want to reach, and that creates a lot of frustration, a lot of comorbid depression, some anxiety, particularly for the poor kids who've been punished for these behaviors, so now they're also amped up because they're worried that they're going to get in trouble, and there's just got to be a better way. Well, that way might be to gradually increase the amount of dopamine or set up an environment where these distractors are no longer a big deal and including enough physical exercise to maybe keep your level of arousal higher. All right, well, so what's the deal with the stimulant drugs? It says about... So I got a little cartoon from Jennifer Berman, and the child is saying, if we're just looking to level the playing field, why don't you just drug the few kids who don't have ADHD? And the physician is saying, what? And forgo all the cool perks from the drug companies? And Jennifer, of course, is a little skeptical about all of this because ADHD meds seem to get really diagnosed a lot. And the companies are obviously competing in order to be able to make these sales. And then it does sort of beg the question, if we've got more than, oh, 10% of the population now getting diagnoses with ADHD, maybe our standard is a little bit wrong. But truth be told, the uh, prescribe the drug from the company that was the last one to fly you to the Bahamas or buy you lunch is uh, a little creepy. And obviously there have been some laws that have crack down on that sort of thing again. So I do have a couple of nice sample multiple choice items here, and I'm going to leave the cahoots 
on links below this video on YouTube. I will email them all around and I will be in touch about uh, what the plans are going to be for our exam and the other midterm and the final as soon as I hear everything from the university. Do not fret. I promise you that last section that's all marijuana all the time will be an important part of the class no matter what. And I'm optimistic we'll get to wrap up the semester in a way that works out okay.